and welcome to Aging Strong, Tufts Medical Center's injury prevention and outreach program that's dedicated to sharing information and resources that empowers older adults. This program is sponsored by the City of Quincy's Health Department. And I want to introduce to you today, Joya Pizzuto, who will be our guest speaker, and she'll be talking about sleep. Did you know that short sleep is short life, basically? And that is something that I heard from uh, many sleep experts out there. We need sleep in order for us to live. Otherwise, it's going to impact our overall health and well-being. And did you know that sleep deprivation has become a public health epidemic, according to the CDC? And that's why I'm so excited to have Joya here to talk about sleep. And her topic is called Sleepless in New England. Joya, can you tell us about your what you do? And, um, and also, can you just give us some, some information about why you think sleep is important for all of us? Sure. So um, thank you, Debbie. Uh, my name is Joya Pizzuto. I work for Melrose Wakefield um, Hospital, which is um, affiliated with Tufts Prison. And um, I've been a community outreach nurse for over 10 years, um, typically going out into the community and helping people stay well. So I do more preventative work than I do um, taking care of acute care patients. But prevention, as we all know, is super important. Um, a lot of the programs that I run are based obviously on chronic health conditions um, and attaining those wellness goals that you may want to um, get to. So sleep is so vital for our health. Um, I think if you're on this call, you're probably not getting um, the sleep that you want to get, or at least um, much of the time. And um, it's just so important for our health. Um, you are, I'm sure you already know how important it is, um, but some things that health, um, sleep does is it makes our health better. It makes our brain function better. It gives us a resistance to illness. So um, health, it helps boost your mood. So um, it can help with anxiety. It can help with depression. Um, it can lower your rate of heart disease. It can help decrease inflammation in your body. And it can help with body weight and body composition. And that's just a few things. So you know, when you get a good night's sleep, how good you feel. Um, so sleep is as important as taking care of your blood pressure. If you have diabetes, taking care of any type of a chronic condition you have, making sure that you get the appropriate amount of sleep every night is very, very important. Mm, definitely, definitely. I know you have a nice presentation to share with us. There is a ton of information in this um, there about 30 minute uh, program. So I highly suggest you have a pen and paper um, and um, we will do Q&A at the end. So, you know, jot your questions down. Um, I'll stop a couple of times throughout the slides just to make sure everybody's kind of grasping what I'm saying. Um, but I don't want to overwhelm you with information, but there is quite a bit of information in this program. So let's talk a little bit about um, common causes of sleep issues. So unfortunately, aging <clears throat> is a common cause of sleep problems. The rules of our bodies change as we age. And that includes sleep patterns. It can become harder to fall asleep and harder to stay asleep. We also will spend less time in deep sleep and more time in lighter stages of sleep, which means we may remember every time we wake up and every time we roll over. So that's an important thing. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Also, the changes a woman's body goes through during perimenopause, menopause, and of course, postmenopause. Um, the fluctuation in hormones is extremely disruptive to sleep. And so that also has a big, um, that can be a big issue for women with sleep related issues. We also see problems with people who have sleep disorders like narcolepsy, restless leg syndrome, and sleep apnea. <clears throat> Excuse me. We also have issues with sleeping if you have mood changes. So depression can sometimes cause you to sleep more. It can also sometimes cause you to sleep less. Having anxiety um, or any type of a mood change can create issues with sleep. 
certain medications you take. So we're not going to go really in deep on medications in this program, but you want to make sure that you have a conversation with your doctor or your pharmacist if you are taking medications to just find out if anything you are taking may be causing um, sleep issues for you. Obviously, chronic health conditions, a couple of that would be pain. So a lot of people, as we age, we may have hip problems, or shoulder problems. And so every time we roll over, we may wake up in night, at night or arthritis may keep us up at night. Also, um, an overactive bladder can do that as well, keeping you up to go to the bathroom. Um, alcohol, nicotine and caffeine, stress, poor sleeping habits, environmental stuff, like maybe you have a partner who snores or um, you live on a street that's very busy and there's a lot of noise. Um, so your environment can play a role. Napping after 3 p.m., going to bed full or hungry. So either one of those can be very disruptive to sleep and also worrying about sleep. So we're going to talk about several of these causes in a minute. But the important takeaway from this slide is the aging piece. So sleep changes with age and, I, and, and it's important that we understand that. And also that as we age, we tend to not get the deep sleep that we got when we were younger. And so when you're sleeping lighter, you're gonna wake up more. And so that's just a given. And so that's just something to, you know, kind of a takeaway from this slide. Okay, so sleep hygiene, <laughs> what exactly? I always thought that was just such a, peculiar way to describe behaviors, um, uh, how we take care of, you know, sleeping. So sleep hygiene is defined as behaviors that you can do to help promote good sleep. And so before I begin getting into um, what the tips are that I'm going to give you today, I want to just make this my disclaimer page, okay? Um, Everyone wants a quick fix. Like if you want to lose weight, you want to start the diet today and get on the scale tomorrow and be down 10 pounds, right? You want to get your blood pressure down. You want to, you know, take a medication and then tomorrow you want your blood pressure to be lower. Unfortunately, you know, there is no magic wand that I can wave around today that's going to make everybody sleep really well tonight and then on into infinity, okay? Um, sleep or any wellness goal you have, whether it's you wanna release weight, you wanna get your blood pressure down, you wanna get your cholesterol in check, or you wanna get a good night's sleep, those are wellness goals and they take time, they take patience, they take dedication, but most importantly, they take creating a daily or nightly habit, right? So with sleep, we're gonna talk about things we can do throughout the day and also in the evening, that can help us get a, a better night's sleep. So um, it will be creating new daily and nightly health habits. In other words, there is no one and done to this program. So like I said, um, there will be a lot of information I'm going to provide. I'm gonna try not to overwhelm you. I typically run this program um, for 60 to 70 minutes um, regularly. So I've cut a lot of it out of it, but um, I did leave the most valuable tips in there. And of course, we will do questions at the end. I am going to begin with tip number one. So tip number one is to start a two-week sleep diary. So yes, it means that you have to do something, but remember the slide I just said, it's gonna take dedication and you creating new things in your world if you really want to get a good night's sleep. So your daily routines, what you eat, what you drink, the medications you take, how you schedule your days, and how you choose to spend your evenings can significantly impact the quality of your sleep. So even a few slight adjustments can, in some cases, mean the difference between sound sleep and a restless night. Completing a two-week sleep diary can help you understand how your routines affect your sleep. So just for an example, say you drink a lot of coffee throughout the day, and each time you have a cup of coffee, you mark it down on this sleep schedule. Then there's a couple of days where you don't drink that much coffee, or maybe you don't drink any at all, and you notice after looking at your two-week schedule that on the days that you didn't drink the coffee, you slept much better. Or on the days that you exercised earlier in the day, you slept better. 
or on the days that you meditated, you slept better, or on the days that you ate a couple of uh, scoops of ice cream late at night, you didn't sleep so good. Okay. So that's why doing a two week diary is really important. And this is one tip that I say, this is one thing you should definitely do. Okay. So where can you get this, um, this particular slide or um, this diary was got off of the um, sleepeducation.org website. And that is the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. And it's a great website to go to. There are a ton of resources on there. You can download this um, diary onto your computer. You can print it out. I even believe now they have one that you can fill in on your, on your computer. So you can make one on your own. <clears throat> you know, However you choose to do that, it's very um, helpful to do the two-week diary. So you can figure out where you're at and what um, habits you might need to change. Okay. Tip number two. So this slide and another slide I'm going to um, share with you in a little ways um, on into this program, everybody gets kind of mad over this slide because we talk about caffeine, which usually is that morning Java, right? So could your beloved Java be keeping you up at night? Well, the possibility is yes, that it could be. So um, according to the American Sleep Foundation, you want to avoid caffeine, whether that's Java or something else, um, four to six hours before bedtime. However, if you are very sensitive to caffeine, you may want to consider avoiding caffeine 10 hours before you go to bed or eliminating it entirely. And I know people don't like to hear that because everybody likes their morning coffee. So that can be um, a little bit of a tough one to give up. But I can tell you, I haven't had coffee in six years and um, I drink water in the morning and it provides me the same benefit as caffeine. So um, you know, it's just, we, we like the flavor of it and so on and so forth. So we also want to remember that caffeine isn't just in coffee. So it can be in tea, it can be in energy drinks, cola, carbonated fruit beverages, some sugar-free drink mixes, some ice cream, some liquor, weight loss pills, herbal supplements, certain headache and migraine medication. So be sure to read the labels. And I want you to watch out for drinks that say, or food in general that says energy, this will give you energy, because that typically means it has a lot of caffeine in it, or a lot of sugar, or both, okay? So next up on that sleep robber is nicotine. So, um, you know, there are a lot of different websites you can go to um, if you are a smoker um, that can help you quit smoking, and that's smokefree.gov. The American Cancer Society has a program and the Center for Disease Control also has some information. So if you do smoke, um, please feel free to um, check out those websites. Um, however, if you continue to use tobacco, please know that it is a stimulant. And so you want to avoid smoking um, at least one to two hours before you go to bed. Then we have alcohol as a sleep robber. So alcohol can interrupt our body's internal clock. Um, it does help you feel drowsy, so it can help you fall asleep, but then it can crash and then you can wake up in the middle of the night, okay? So it really doesn't actually help you sleep. So once the effects of alcohol wear off, you can wake up. In addition to that, if you have any breathing problems, alcohol can aggravate those problems. And so that can just not be good um, and also keep you up at night. And then of course, alcohol leads to extra trips to the bathroom. So that again can keep you up at night. And then lastly on this slide is sugar. So sugar, there is evidence that consuming more sugar is linked to more restless, disruptive sleep and a harder time falling asleep. So think about this, if you, if you have children or you take care of grandchildren or anything like that, you want to think about giving a child a slice of chocolate cake and a cola right before bedtime. And think about what that might do, right? They're not going to go to bed, right? So that's the same thing for adults, right? So if we eat a lot of sugar um, prior to bedtime, we're going to be restless in bed. And so if your nightly um, routine currently is to have 
maybe some Oreos and milk or some ice cream. You might want to rethink when you eat that throughout the day so that it's not, you know, a couple, an hour or two before you go to bed. I can really relate to some of the uh, sleep robbers that you've talked about with the uh, oh, yeah. sugar and the caffeine mm -hmm. and, you know, some sometimes nice wine, you know, it can really impact the sleep quality. And uh, I like tip number two, because it really um, shows on paper your everybody or whoever is going to be participating um, their habits. So it's a good way to start taking in, taking out different things that could impact the sleep. So it's really nice to um, be able to do that. Great. Thank you, Debbie. All righty. So tip number three, whole body wellness. So in any program that I do, if you've been on any of my programs, you'll know that I never just talk about the chronic health condition itself. It is so vitally important that we learn ways to treat our body as a whole, right? So that we take care of ourselves as a whole and not just treat one specific thing. So eating a balanced and varied diet. So what might that look like? So fruits and vegetables, whole grains, low fat dairy products, lean proteins like poultry and fish, adding plant-based proteins to your day is another great idea, increasing nut intake, um, and avoiding saturated and trans fats. So remember what you eat throughout the day, particularly later in the evening plays a very large role in your sleep at night. So eat earlier in the evening and avoid supersizing your dinner. I always tell people that sometimes we well, I guess we've learned along the way that like, you know, dinner is usually the biggest meal, but maybe you want to flip that around and make your lunch a bigger meal and your dinner um, maybe not as large because especially if you eat later at night, your body has to digest that food. And that can be disruptive to sleep as well, because your body needs energy to digest food, right? So if your body needs energy, it's not going to be wanting to go to bed if it has to digest food. Um, also staying hydrated throughout the day. So I always have, you know, I don't know if you can see this because of my screen, but I have a, a bottle of water that I keep with me and I sip it throughout the day. So I'm not saying chug water or wait until seven o'clock to get your daily water intake in. Drink your water throughout the day and tapering it off at the end of the day so that you're not up all night going to the bathroom, right? So maybe around seven o'clock, you start really tapering your water, but you're getting your water in throughout the day because being dehydrated can actually cause you to have sleep issues, okay? And also drinking a lot of water right before you go to bed can too, because you'll be up going to the bathroom, but dehydration can do things to your body that make it very unsettled. And so that can also create sleep problems. Exercising regularly. I talk about this in every class that I um, teach and exercise is just so important. I could do an hour and a half program just on exercise. So exercise is known to help our bodies in so many ways. It helps our mood, it helps our heart, it helps our muscles, it helps our flexibility, and it helps us sleep. So exercise can help you sleep better and promotes deeper sleep. So try exercising earlier in the day if possible, but avoid strenuous exercises three hours prior to bed because exercise does give us, give us a little boost of energy. So, you know, Try to exercise early, maybe in the morning or, <clears throat> excuse me, in the afternoon, but you don't want to probably go and do a HIIT workout at nine o'clock at night if you know you're going to be going to bed at, you know, 10, right? So we don't want to do that. And then also learning ways to manage stress. So I do offer a program. It's uh, about an hour and a half long on ways to manage stress. And I can't obviously get into um, what that would look like, but stress is a sleep robber. Okay. So stress and sleep have a two way relationship. Stress can lead to sleep loss and conversely loss of sleep can increase stress. So occasionally stress at bedtime is inevitable. Um, and having a plan for coping with stress can help you prevent stress from interfering with your sleep. 
We offer a great program on stress, as I had just mentioned. So um, hopefully maybe you'll be able to um, attend that sometime. Tip number four, create a bedtime routine. Mm -hmm. So um, we are looking, so this program itself, or just any sleep program really is looking to retrain our brain for sleep. So as the sun goes down, our brain begins to think sleep, relaxation, cozy, bedtime, things like that. And so, you know, I came up with a list of things to create a bedtime routine, but that's really up to you what that might look like. So some ideas are um, go to bed and get up at the same time every day. Um, give or take 20 minutes. And that includes weekends. And all that is doing is just getting us into a schedule, right? So our brain likes habit. It likes doing things that it's used to doing. So if we get ourselves into a nice routine, that can help us. Perhaps beginning to unwind early in the evening. So maybe after dinner, you begin to dim the lights. Uh, Maybe you want to take a warm bath or a warm shower or try a cup of herbal tea. Um, Try some relaxation techniques um, like a meditation or something like that. Listening to soothing music or nature sounds. Um, So most people nowadays have smartphones and you can, um, you know, download a free app that has, you know, different types of sounds on it. Some people like the sound of a fan or a rainstorm or something like that. Uh, maybe do some light reading or a bedtime story. And um, actually, there are books now that you can buy that are specifically for bedtime. And they're really like one or two, you know, you read one or two chapters. They talk real, it's really about nothing. Like it's it's crazy, but, um, you know, the stories are just very gentle and um, very nice way to kind of end your evening. Um, so you want to choose things that are easy on your brain. And that's important to remember because if you're doing all kinds of really crazy activity before you expect yourself to get into bed and then have your brain immediately shut down, it's not going to happen. So creating a bedtime routine is very important. Okay, tip number five is creating your own sleep haven. So love your bedroom, create an environment that is cozy, comfortable, and conducive to sleep. Many of us use the bedroom as a home office or a classroom during the pandemic. And this created a lot of sleep problems and we're seeing them now, particularly in children because they were doing their schoolwork the same in in their bed actually with a computer on their lap. And so this has become very disruptive because our brain is associating our bedroom with waking activities. So that's not very helpful, okay? So um, we, again, want to retrain our brain. So when we go into the bedroom, our mind and body connection associates it with relaxing, comfort, and sleep. So doing activities in the bedroom like uh, watching TV, talking on the phone, working on your computer is a no-no for your bedroom, okay? And people often don't like me telling them that because a lot of people like to watch TV in their bedroom. So you want to use your bedroom for sleep and sex, and that's it. Block out any unwanted noise. So try earplugs or a white noise machine. Keep your room a comfortable temperature. Sleep experts recommend a slightly cooler room, but not cold. So there's nothing worse than having your feet really cold. I know that's very um, uncomfortable. So a cooler room, but not, you know, like an ice box. Um, Sleeping on a comfortable mattress and pillow. Yes, Mattresses and pillows have life expectancies. People sometimes don't realize that, but you can't, you know, if you're sleeping on a mattress that's 20 or 30 years old, or I mean, even now, like 15 years old, it might be time to reevaluate if that's what's keeping you up. You know, is your mattress not comfortable or is your pillow not comfortable anymore? So think about that. A dark room contributes to better sleep. So maybe you need to get room darkening blinds um, or shades. And you can also try aromatherapy. Things like vanilla and lavender are extremely relaxing scents. And many people enjoy that. Now, you know, you can buy those little, um, I forget what they're called, those, but the mist that blows out of them and you put the little essential oil in them. And then, you know, that can be a very, um, a very nice way to go along with that routine you're going to create, right? Of relaxation. Okay. 
Tip number six. So remember um, back a few slides ago, I said there were two slides that people hated. One was the caffeine one. This is the other one. So um, many of us spend too much time in junk light, but natural sunlight and darkness are powerful biological indicators. Seeing the sun regularly each day helps keep our internal clock in sync. We naturally feel more awake and energetic during daylight hours. And when it's dark out, our internal clock tells us it's time to go to bed. By seeing daylight in the morning, your body slows down the production of melatonin to wake you up and increase output. And it increases the output of melatonin at night to help you go to sleep. So in order for this to work the way it was intended to, we need to give our brains time to heal and quiet down. And that really means unplugging from all the artificial light. So unfortunately, yes, I'm talking about TVs, iPads, laptops, smartphones, Kindles, video games, you get the picture, okay? So the blue light emitted from electronic screens stimulates your brain and promotes wakefulness, okay? Now, yes, I mean, you know, I've had people on my um in my programs before say, well, you know, there's dimmers and stuff like that. And yes, there are. So you can get glasses. There they are right there. Okay. So these are relatively inexpensive. I picked them up at, I don't know, probably Marshall's or something, but they have like a little blue tinge to them and, and they make the screen a little um, tone, a little warmer in tone. So um, you could get a pair of glasses like that. You can also opt, I know, um, smartphones and iPads um, have like a night mode that you can put um, on so that they get like this yellow tint to them. So it's not this like bright light coming at you. But, um, you know, let's, let's just be honest here. You know, blocking out blue light is okay, all right? But let's give our brains a rest and unplug in the evening for one to two hours. And I know people hate to hear that because we're so addicted to um, junk light. So another way to look at this is that you could spend some time thinking about what you can do in place of electronics before bed. Explore where you might opt for lesser stimulating activities doing things I like to call old school, okay? Things like reading, not, you know, a nice book, not as, you know, not something like a horror or something like that, but something that's just very gentle reading. Um, doing a picture puzzle or perhaps coloring. Those coloring books are everywhere and you can get some colored pencils and that's also a great way to do active meditation and that can help your brain. Knitting, things like that listening to soft music, relaxing sounds, things that help quiet your brain down. And you can teach this to your children. You can teach this to your grandkids too. So maybe have a family event where you kind of discuss, what are we going to do in place of watching, binge watching um, the latest Netflix t movie or whatever on TV at night. So there are great things that you can come up with that don't involve staring at a blue screen, okay? And that's really important. This is a very important one, um, tip to remember, um, and a lot of people don't like it because, you know, we do oftentimes use the TV to help us get to sleep or social media and things like that, but they are sleep robbers. <clears throat> okay. Tip number seven. So what exactly is sleep worry or sleep worrying or procrastination? Like what exactly is that? And this is kind of, this is a little bit new to me, the procrastinating is anyway, <clears throat> and I do it. So let's talk about what that is. So sometimes we may be our own worst enemy, <clears throat> excuse me, sleep worry or sleep anxiety might look like this. You've had several nights in a row of sleeplessness. You begin to feel apprehensive throughout the day in fear of not sleeping well again that night. Dreading your bed, dreading the bedroom can turn into a vicious cycle of worry and sleeplessness. So it may sound silly, but if you think about it, a lot of people, I mean, I talk to a lot of people every day and I know that many people will be like, oh, I slept so horrible last night and I have such a you know a big day tomorrow and I'm probably not going to sleep good tonight. So obsessing about sleep or talking about how little you get 
and how awful it is can make it worse. Remember this, what you resist persists. Okay, so using relaxation techniques before bed can help your brain put worry on hold. So let's talk a little bit about procrastinating. So what does that look like? So it might look a little bit like this. You've worked all day or you've been busy all day. By the time you eat dinner and finish your nightly chores, it's 9 p.m., maybe even later. And you're tired and you're beat, but... You really want to watch five episodes of that latest Netflix series that you really, really like. And so you ought to watch TV or do some other entertainment activity. But by doing this, you are cutting hours out of your sleep schedule and you are now a night owl with an early bird schedule. So sleep procrastination refers to delaying sleep in response to stress or a lack of free time earlier in the day. And I do this, I am such a culprit to this. I finish cooking my meals and putting everything away and doing laundry and packing stuff for the next day. And then I go to sit down and I'm really tired. And if I got into bed, I probably would fall right to sleep, but I wanna watch one more episode of something or I just want that time to, you know, do something other than all work and sleep and there's no play in between, right? And that's kind of what sleep procrastination is. So for many people, sleep procrastination is a response to extended working hours that if combined with a full night's sleep of seven to nine hours, they leave no virtually no time for entertainment or relaxation. So people begin to shave time off of their sleep so they can gain time in other areas, And so that's tough. And this is, this is new. This is, um, I have just done some research on this and this is procrastination has really only come out in the last couple of years. I'm sure it's been going on for a while, but research is now being done on that. So how can you prevent sleep procrastination? Well, we've covered quite a bit so far, and it really comes down to retraining your brain with positive sleep habits. Um, keeping a consistent bedtime schedule, avoiding alcohol or caffeine um, later in the day, stop the use of electronic devices one to two hours before bed, developing a stable routine to use every night to prepare for bed, and using relaxation techniques that help quiet your brain can ease you into sleep. But if, however, you find that worry and anxiety and stress and procrastination is getting the better of you, It might be time to chat with your doctor who may refer you to a specialist or a therapist, because, you know, if you do have a lot of anxiety or depression or any, any sort of thing like that, you know, maybe you need a little bit more help than um, some of the information on this program. And there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. So tip number eight, medication. So I did say, I'm not going to go in depth into medication because I don't know your medical history. I don't know the medications you take. So I'm not going to suggest any over the counter or anything like that to you, but I am going to talk a little bit about medication. So having sleep issues can really impact your life, but before you head to the local pharmacy to pick up an over the counter medication, talk with your doctor first. You never know if one medication may have a negative impact on another medication that you are currently taking or on how another medication may impact a chronic condition that you have. So it's also important to remember that medication for sleep, prescription or over-the-counter, can have an unwanted side effects like grogginess, dizziness, concentration problems, and all of those can lead to an increase, an increased risk for fall or other accident. So before trying something on your own, run it by your doctor first. That includes products that are labeled as natural. Natural does not always come with um, without side effects and does not always mean safe and healthy. So that's pretty much all I'm going to say about medication. So talk to your doctor or pharmacist first before you run out to, you know, the local pharmacy to grab something off of the shelf. Okay, <clears throat> tip number nine, and this is my, by far, my very favorite tip for learning to get a better night's sleep or 
getting a better night's sleep. So meditation is a great option to get sleep and to get to sleep and to stay asleep. It's safe. It has no side effects. It doesn't cost anything. It can be done by anybody. <clears throat> and unlike the picture on this slide, you don't have to sit in any particular position. Just find a comfortable, quiet place to sit or lie down, close your eyes and follow the wave of your breath. It's really that simple. When you notice your mind wandering, just bring it back to your breath. It's easy. Um, meditation can help lower your blood pressure. It can reduce anxiety. It can quiet your mind. It can help you be more creative and productive. It can help with focus and memory, and it can help you sleep. So meditation builds on itself. So it's not a one and done. So in other words, you don't you know leave the call today and tonight say, oh, well, Joya said, I can meditate tonight for five minutes and then I'm going to sleep like a rock. And no, that's not how meditation works. So meditation works. It builds on itself. So it's over an extended period of time. And like I said, in my disclaimer page, it's time, it's patience, it's dedication, it's building ha sleep habits daily. So you add this into your daily routine and you notice over a period of time, suddenly you notice the benefits of it. So, you know, where can you obtain um, information about meditation? So you might be able to find it at your local library. You might be able to get a video on it. You might be able to get borrow a book um, or a CD. Um, your local senior center may have a program available. Bookstores, accredited internet sites that end in .org, .edu, or .gov may have information as well. There are also a plenty of free apps, and I'm saying free apps on your smartphone or tablet or whatever. Um, you don't have to pay for them. I have one on my phone. I use it every night and I've, you know, I've never paid a dime for it. And I, it does help me fall asleep. And if I wake up in the middle of the night, it helps me get back to sleep. So things like meditation, deep breathing, progressive muscle relaxation or body scanning, guided imagery, distraction techniques or sleep countdown, um, using the best part of today. So that's basically reliving a good day from start to finish as you get into bed can really help you stop worrying and, and anxiety. Um, Yoga Nidra, which is yogic sleep. It is not, you're not on the floor doing all kinds of stretches and poses and all of that. It's very, very different type of yoga um, or gentle stretching. So if you have a lot of pain um, or tight muscles, getting, doing a gentle stretching program, even if you're sitting in a chair, um, can actually help your body, that mind-body connection or relaxation. So Meditation and any of these things on this slide, I highly recommend. I really do believe that they are very, very beneficial over a period of time. So this is like brushing your teeth. You do it every day, twice a day, and always, right? So we add that into our um, schedule. So we're almost done here. So I hope everybody's, I haven't overwhelmed you. Um, so how do you put this all together? Because this is quite a bit of information that I gave you. And if you start doing everything all at once, that's tough and you might not be successful. So, you know, what can you do? So sleep is a healthy habit. So dedication um, to this healthy habit is one of the best steps uh, you can take to a healthier you. So use the sleep diary. I highly recommend that you do do the sleep diary to find areas that might be causing your sleepless nights. Okay, that's important. Try the two by two, um, two tips for two weeks. So don't take everything from this program and then try to manage it and get it into your day because that's not going to be beneficial. So choose two things. Maybe you do the sleep diary and you start meditating. Do them for two weeks every day, right? And then assess how it worked at the end of the two weeks. Did you find anything on your diary that might help you sleep better? Did you notice after the two weeks of meditating at night that it did quiet your mind and it did help you fall asleep and it is working, but you still need to do it? Or did this stuff not work? That's okay. You've got a ton of tips to go to, to go back to. So you go back to the drawing board, you pick two more, you do them for two more weeks and you reassess at the end of the two weeks. Okay. If you are really, really, I mean, 
Sleep deprivation is horrible. I've had it. Um, you know, there are some nights that it, it's really bad. And so honestly, if you are really struggling and it is causing all kinds of focus issues for you during the day, and it's really just um, impacting your world terribly, it's time to talk to your primary care doctor. And that's important. Now, um, your doctor may maybe perhaps prescribe a medication. They may suggest that you see a cognitive behavioral therapist. And there are actually people who do CBT for insomnia. And the uh, cognitive behavioral therapists guide patients through a series of changes in sleep-related behaviors. All of the stuff we talked about today, but they have accountability with a therapist. So the person can really help you navigate all of this information better. And that may be um, an option for you. And then also seeing a sleep specialist. So, you know, finding out if you have sleep apnea or a restless leg syndrome or some other sleep um, issue. And um, Melrose Wakefield Hospital does have a department of sleep medicine. Um, and you could be referred there um, to get a sleep study done. So with that said, I'm going to um, stop my share. Lots of great information on sleep. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's I feel like even for myself, as I get older, I never really appreciated the power of sleep until, you know, I had moments or nights where I could not sleep or even working as a bedside nurse for many moons ago, mm -hmm. uh, having to do different shifts, right? Day shift, evening shift, and sometimes having to do an evening night shift because of an ill call. So, you know, sleep deprivation for me, it, it just, um, it throws off my focus. It throws off my ability to concentrate and even sometimes talk. <laughs> you know, yeah. if, if I'm really sleep deprived, I get so incoherent. So I can't even imagine having a chronic condition such as like insomnia, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what, are, um, Joya, what are some of the more common sleep problems that, um, you know, people who particularly, you know, who tend to, um, you know, join your programs, what are some of the uh, sleep problems that um, they usually typically share? So uh, there's a combination. So a lot of people have difficulty getting to sleep. Mm. And some people have difficulty, um, they wake up in the middle of the night and can't get back to sleep. And some people have both of those. Um, so th that would be probably um, the two biggest complaints that I hear um, that people do. And so with getting to sleep at night, I really do say the routine, getting yourself into a nightly routine. And again, it's not one and done. You're not going to go do a set up a routine tonight. And that's going to take you, um, you know, think about a child. If you've had children or grandchildren or anything like that, when you go to put them to bed, it isn't like you just put them into bed. They have a routine, right? Maybe they brush their teeth. Maybe that you read them a book or, you know, there's a routine that's involved. And even though we're adults, it doesn't mean that, that our brain doesn't still want that routine. Mm -hmm. And so that's very important. Yeah. Yeah. Very important. So creating a sleep hygiene that basically begins the moment you get out of bed in the morning, mm -hmm. because that's going to set you up for success. Exactly. You're on in the day. So that, that could be what we put into our mouth, the caffeines or the alcohols or the sugary food, yes. um, knowing when to stop. I mean, I love that you mentioned uh, water hydrating because oh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's going to also impact our sleep, whether we drink a lot of water close to our bedtime or mm -hmm. being dehydrated during the day, that's going to impact it as well. At night. And I know that a lot of people sometimes have overactive bladders and that that actually is probably the third complaint I hear that I'm up all night going to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And so that's like one, that's a conversation to have with your doctor. I mean, maybe um, a urologist. Um, because there are things that can be done for that. It's also a conversation maybe with your doctor about any medications you might take that could act as diuretics um, or that could be creating that. And so, you know, it's good to make sure that your doctor is in the loop. Sometimes people feel embarrassed about talking about bodily functions like that. So you want to make sure that your doctor is aware of that because maybe you can take a medication earlier in the day. 
But I do know that a lot of people who have overactive bladders avoid drinking water. Mm -hmm. And then that just is like this vicious cycle of dehydration. And then all that comes with that, like just not feeling well, your body, you can't sleep well at night because you're dehydrated, but then you just, you feel icky when Mm -hmm. you don't drink enough water. So it's hydration is very important. Yeah. Yeah. If anybody has any questions, please um, feel free to unmute yourself or type it in the chat. So that way we could, uh, you know, answer your questions for you the best that we can. Okay. I had a tip that I wanted to share that uh, periodically I have trouble, you know, staying asleep at night, but now I found a weighted blanket. Uh It's been very helpful to me. Um, So that may be something that people may want to look into. Um, And I think it's supposed to be between um, either five or 12% of your body weight, the weight of the blanket. But I have felt very good since you use it. I'm actually using an extra blanket that's a little heavy. And I've found that I've been able to sleep a little bit better because of it. Thank you. Thank you. Can you describe how big your weighted blanket is so that for people who, you know, can't, you know, imagine what it looks like? Is it does it take up the whole size of your bed? Or is it it could? Well, it could take up the whole size of the bed, but I fold it. So it's a little heavier just on top of me. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't actually bought the weighted blanket, but the weight of this blanket on me has been very beneficial to my sleep. Mm, Thank you. And by folding it, it's a fleece blanket. It's fleece. So it it gets a little heavier as you fold it. And uh, it it really gives you that warm comfort, you know, and it does sometimes get a little hot. You just take it off. But I've found that it's really been very helpful for my sleep. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Does anybody else have any tips or any questions? I have one question. Sure. Um, so do you know about melatonin? Is it something that should be avoided all the time or is it okay for occasional use? So um, I'll answer that question with, with this comment in mind. Um, if you or somebody you know is having difficulty sleeping, I don't know their, their health background mm-hmm. or what they take. Um, and so it's really important to talk to a doctor uh, about that before you take any over-the-counter medications. But many people do take over-the-counter mel- melatonin, um, uh, usually in very low doses. Um, and I think that it's melatonin is safe to take um, periodically. Um, I know that we don't want to sometimes take something that can actually cause our body to not release, um, the melatonin either. And so that really is a, um, a conversation with a doctor that can say, no, it's okay for you to take it for six months, three, three milligrams a day or whatever. So, but yeah, I mean, I think it's okay to take as long as it's, um, you run it by your doctor and how long and how many milligrams too, you know, that's another thing. Because the doctors, you know, are better off. It's that they may go higher on the milligrams in terms of. Yeah. And let me just add a couple of things as well. Um, Using the same disclaimer as Joya just shared. (laughs) Um, uh, Melatonin will help you fall asleep. Mm -hmm. So some people think it's going to help you stay asleep. It just helps you fall asleep. And because it's not regulated, uh, what you buy over the counter um, may have, it might say maybe three milligrams. And uh, one company might have actually less than three milligrams, even though that's what's stated in the bottle again, because it's not regulated or it might say three milligrams, but it might have actually 10 milligrams in it. So always check with your doctor, um, to see if that's going to be helpful for you. And maybe they could recommend a brand that um, a good quality brand for you to take. But um, definitely, you know, just people think when they take melatonin, they're going to fall asleep and stay asleep. It just helps you fall asleep. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions? That's great. We're getting tips and questions. Um, Could I say something, Beverly? Um, I find meditation helps tremendously. I meditate every night. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, Just like Joya said, it's like brushing your teeth. You have to do it consistently. And that helps me unwind, sets me up for sleep. But my problem is I have an extremely overactive bladder. So when she touched on the deep sleep versus the light sleep, that helped me tremendously because I don't really get that much of a deep sleep. Right. I get a lot of light sleep. Mm -hmm. That's probably why I'm tired in the morning too when I wake up. It's like, ah, but then I come around after a while, but it's very, it takes a while. But Mm -hmm. I have, I do have a gyno-urologist. I have cut back on the water, but that is a struggle for me because I'm always thirsty and I'm not diabetic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And maybe talk to your um, urogynecologist about pelvic floor dysfunction. Oh, I have all those. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because there are, you know, sometimes the overactive bladder can be linked to um, pelvic floor issues. So a really tight pelvic floor can squeeze your bladder and cause you to feel like you have to go to the bathroom more often. And so um, having a conversation about pelvic floor, even pelvic floor PT, physical therapy for pelvic floor, which is that's a specialist, a special physical therapist that works with you on that, that can help. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying it's the, the end all answer, right. but um, yeah, overactive bladder can have more than just, you know, one or two causes and pelvic floor can definitely cause it. Pelvic yeah. floor dysfunction. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Even men, if they have an enlarged mm-hmm. prostate, yeah. you know, the same bad sleep issues, waking up frequently to because of that urgency and feel like you have to urinate and it's a big sleep robber. Yeah. 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 So uh, Joya, I love the, all the tips that you shared and Beverly, you mentioned meditation. I was doing a program for a group of uh, older adults yesterday on mindfulness and sleep came up as, you know, what can we do for sleep with mindfulness? Well, you know, you could do a body scan meditation or a breathing meditation um, or um, the progressive muscle relaxation. I would not really use that because that's more energizing because you're tightening up your muscles and then releasing it. But that can also, you know, d- during a day, if you feel like you need an energy booster instead of grabbing that caffeine, right? Uh, right. Or tea. So just remembering that caffeine has a long half life and it stays in our system. So just really knowing your body, knowing what you're not just at one stage of your life, because my body is my 20 year old body is different from my 55 year old body. Mm -hmm. And so what my 20 year old body was able to tolerate and do back then is different from this body right now. So we always have to have this commitment to get to know our body at every stage of our life, because it's going to keep changing. The needs are going to be changing what we can do, what we can, you know, digest and put up with so different. Don't you agree, Joya? I do. I mean, your body definitely changes as you age um, completely different. Like even foods that I used to be able to eat 10 years ago, I, I, they just don't agree with me anymore. So absolutely. The body changes and it's important. You are your biggest advocate. You are the most important person on your healthcare team. So you really need to um, remember that. Yeah. You can advocate for yourself and know your body and and know the things that might be helpful. Yeah. 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 And, you know, programs such as the one that you just are doing right now, sleep is so important because it brings awareness to how important sleep is and how it impacts our mental and physical health. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure you have more information to cover, but just knowing that, um, you know, there are many informations out there out in the internet to, you know, give you tips and um, guidelines and just, you know, information on how important sleep is for us. Now, Joya, we're almost at the top of the hour here. Can you give us, and I know your this program that you just shared is a, typically an hour and a half long program. Can you give us maybe one or two more tips um, to kind of uh, digest before we end the program? Sure. So a lot of people um, like to nap. And so people have usually asked questions about napping. Um, and so, yeah, 
if that's the way you're getting in sleep, then I say, you know, a nap is okay. It, um, it will definitely help with, um, you know, giving you a little bit more energy throughout the day. But I will say this, nap, napping is not a substitute for a good night's sleep. Um, it can be more restorative. Uh, you should avoid napping after three o'clock and nap should be no more than 20 to 30 minutes. So I know a lot of people might be dozing for two hours and that can be very disruptive to sleep too. So be careful about your naps. I'm not saying don't do them, but 20 to 30 minutes before three o'clock. Um, and, uh, getting back to sleep. I know I mentioned no, um, you know, no use of cell phones and things like that, because I don't want that blue light. But if you have an app on your phone, I'm okay with you turning on the app quickly, not, not staring at it on Facebook or some, um, you know, social network, but just getting it on quickly and popping maybe some earbuds in if you're, if you sleep with somebody else, um, and listening to, um, somebody tell you a story, a bedtime story, or um, listening to quiet music or anything like that can really help you get back to sleep and to sleep in general. So, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much for those two extra tips. Yeah. You can't get enough of those tips. So just remember, sleep is important, but at the same time, knowing that there are different ways to help us sleep is very empowering because what one tip can work one night Might may not, not work, work the next night. So it's good to have different tips. Always ask your doctor about medications, especially over the counter medications that could help with sleep. And just, you know, being so familiar with how your body is, how it responds to food, stress, everything is so important because that's going to, it may impact your sleep. So Joya Pizzuto, thank you for um, telling us about the importance of sleep today. Everybody, thank you so much for being here.